Visitors Travel Association here at World Dairy Expo. Now, I mentioned that I uh, was looking at my cell phone for the time, and I would just ask that everybody kind of take a look at these things, either put them on silent or vibrate or something to make sure that we have a, a nice ambiance, uh, nice uh, situation in here for the presentation that you're about to hear. The Jersey Association has presented, as I said, five different uh, programs to date in the series, and each one of these has taken a different theme. So our first one was looking at herd in California and talking about internal herd growth. The second one was uh, based in Kansas. And we were talking to the owner of a former Holstein operation as he converted to that operation to Jersey's and looking how he used a particular program that we offer called Jersey Mate and how that made him be very successful in his matings when he didn't know the Jersey breed. The third one, we went to Virginia, and to the herd of a master breeder, Jim Hufford, a famous breeder of, of the Hallmark Bull. And uh, basically what we did there was we looked at the conscious decision that was made by his grandfather and his father, and he continually makes over time to stay with Jersey on a profit economic basis. The fourth one, we went to Oregon, again to the herd of a master breeder at Forest Glen Jerseys, and we looked at how they used the genetic recovery program to build a lucrative business that not only sells uh, cattle in the local area, but also bulls to AI organizations and germplasm, both domestically and internationally. Then last year, and I know several of you in the room I recognize from last year's program were here, we talked, uh, we went to Ohio, to Clover Patch, Jerseys, and looked at what uh, the owners did there to build a herd from scratch and use the unique characteristics of the Jersey cow for grazing and also the components in Jersey milk to increase the profitability of their dairy farm and, and create a good, secure future for themselves and their young growing family. So today we're going to explore the thematic of sustainability. And we're going to look at it in multiple senses of that concept at St. Bridget's Farm, which is a registered Jersey operation near Kennedy, Kennedyville, Maryland, or on the Eastern Shore. So I was just there. You have to go over the Bay Bridge and it's quite a ways out there. And it's a lovely, lovely farm and a fantastic setting if you ever had the oppor uh, opportunity to go there. So with no further ado, it's a privilege to introduce to you the owners and today's speakers, Dr. Robert Fry and Judy Gifford. Please welcome them. Thank you, Sherry. And we want to really thank the uh, World Dairy Expo for accepting our application and for Sherry for nominating us. We are in quite distinguished company with that lineup that she just described, so I'm really even more flattered now that she's put it in perspective of whom we are following. Um, we are also um, members of the Jersey REAP program and use many of their services. We use the Jersey Mate program quite, uh, quite exclusively in uh, my Jersey mating season in the spring, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, scoring our cows in the end of October. So. Um, we are thrilled to be here, and we thank you all for coming out, uh, coming to see us on this beautiful day with so much going on. I know it's hard to tell your, tear yourself away, so thanks for coming. Um, our farm is named after St. Bridget's. She's the patron saint of dairy maids and scholars, so she, we thought that was the perfect match for Bob, the scholar, the veterinarian, and me, the dairy maid, the milker. So our friend came up with that name for us, and besides the fact that it's kind of hard to spell, we really find that it... Um, applies to our farm. She was supposed to have been very compassionate, and the legend has it she turned her um, bath water into beer, as well as milked her cows three times a day, so she fit right with uh, some of our favorite things. <laughs> Bob and I actually met at the American Jersey Cattle Association picnic in 1991 when it was he held on the western shore of Maryland, and the uh, farm where I worked, Windy Knoll Farm, held the picnic. And so Bob was there as one of the uh, supporters, and I was there as a worker, and they had a post-picnic party, and that's where we met. So we have a lot of ties to the Jersey breed. I uh, started with Jerseys in 1969. I bought my first calf, Pete Farms, Jewel Host Rita, from a sealed bid sale at the 4-H Fair. 
and uh, had jerseys all through my 4-H career because we couldn't compete with the registered Holsteins. My dad had a small grade Holstein farm in Connecticut. And Bob grew up on a dairy farm, uh, which has, had a Holstein, uh, Holstein cows, but he readily agreed to go with the Jersey cow, and I don't think he's regretted it since. We established our farm in 1996. I had had a career as a 4-H agent, and then um, I had to get my master's degree, so I ended up with an internship in Washington, D.C., and uh, then I worked, on, I worked at the National Institutes of Health, then I worked uh, and for Congressman Steve Gunderson from, formerly Congressman Steve Gunderson from Wisconsin, and then I went over and worked for the uh, National Milk Producers Federation before I became a farmer, my dream job. A bad day farming is still better than a good day lobbying, is what I always say. And Bob has been a bovine practitioner for 30 some odd years and is still in practice. Speaking of his practice, one of his clients owned this farm before we did, and we knew that Larry uh, wasn't going to be staying with cows much very long. He just didn't, he wasn't a cow man, as they say. So we just told him, whenever you want to sell, we'd be interested, and it worked out perfectly. We had a private sale, and we bought the farm from him in uh, 1996. I bought my, uh, I bought 60 Jersey, open Jersey heifers, and I bought my last one from Paul Petersheim on the western shore of Maryland on my 40th birthday. So it was a nice way to start my 40th, 41st year milking cows. About our farm, we're, we're small. We have 55 acres of, per, of pasture. Most of it is permanent. We um, have 75 registered milking cows on average. We have 75 Jersey heifers. They're also registered. We raise 45, at the moment we have 45 Jersey steers and veal calves. We do rotational, intensive rotational grazing, seasonal breeding, but year-round milking. Our milk is sold to Land O'Lakes Cooperative and Roo's Food, which is a small Hispanic cheese company we'll tell you about in a minute. Our surplus cows are sold to other dairy farmers. And our beef and veal is sold through what we call relationship marketing. Uh, in 2010, our herd average was 19,867 pounds of milk, 936 pounds of fat, 754 pounds of milk protein on an ME basis. That's two times a day with no BST. Our JPI is 78. Our cheese merit index is $222. Our average somatic cell count is 97,000. And our cull rate is 38%, but our beef cull rate is 6%, and our dairy cull rate is 32%. Our pregnancy rate is something we're very proud of. It's 28%. So this is our farm, and you can see it's a postage stamp. And it's in a very um, large agricultural county. It's the smallest county in the state, but we grow the most corn of any, well, most years, the most corn of any county in the state. And um, when we bought our farm, it looked like the rest of those pastures up here. It was all corn, beans, and wheat. So we've turned it into a nice little green oasis. And uh, when we started, Bob said, well, if you're going to be small, you're going to have to, we're going to have to diversify, intensify, and be good at, be, do well at everything we do if we're going to be successful and sustainable. So that's been our motto from the beginning. Um, when we first started, there were 33 dairy farms in the county. Now there are about 10. We were one of the last ones to start a new dairy, in, or start as a new dairy farmer in the county. Um, happily, Bob's nephew has taken over his brother's farm, and another young farmer has come back home to um, Tom Mason's, Tom and Alice Mason's farm, they're Jersey farmers, also in um, Kent County. So that's a little encouraging, but it's been pretty discouraging to see those 20 some odd, 40, they were 40 at the time, most of them when they went out of business, and none of their kids wanted to take over the business. So it's been kind of depressing in that regard, but there have been some uh, New farms come in along the, about the same year our farm started. Um, Sean Jones started a 1,200 cow dairy up the road from us. So within 10 miles, you can see the California style farming and you can see the New Zealand style farming. So we do get a lot of tours in here to do that kind of comparison. So when we started, we said, well, what's going to make us successful? And we came up with these three cornerstones. And actually, John Eichert, the University of Missouri, I was reading an article in um, Wendell Berry, one of Wendell, Wendell Berry's essays. And he um, outlined these three cornerstones way more succinctly than we did. So these are our three cornerstones for success and profitability. Economic viability, ecological soundness, and a positive influence on the community. 
And for us, the center of all of that is the Jersey cow. And uh, she is uh, one of the most profitable cows you can own. She has the smallest carbon footprint. And there's nobody in the world who doesn't get impressed by seeing a little Jersey calf or meeting a Jersey cow for the first time. So she's really been helpful in reach, uh, for us to reach all of our goals. And now I'm going to let Bob talk about economic viability. Thank you, Jude. And um, welcome again. We appreciate you being here today. <clears throat> um, the economic viability at St. Bridget Farm uh, really focuses on growing high quality and a high quantity of grass, converting that into or selling high margin outputs. What are the three high margin outputs that we sell? They're simply milk, meat, and surplus livestock. Okay? So the, the whole driving point behind our economics is to grow high quality and quantity and convert them into these three things. Now, Judy showed a slide earlier that uh, showed our JP, uh, yeah, JPI of 78. And it's my understanding that that's pretty good. We don't really understand the JPI all that well. Uh, we don't strive to have a very high JPI. We do strive to do what I have on this slide here. And just naturally, a high JPI evolves from that. So um, I want to go through a few slides showing the uh, the products that we do market. Our milk, uh, as Judy says, goes to two markets. First, uh, probably 80 or 90 percent of it goes to uh, Ruse Food Company. Ruse Food is a company owned by some folks from El Salvador. They manufacture soft Hispanic cheeses for distribution all over the Northeast United States. Um, they've been in business for 17 years and they uh, buy our milk exclusively. We're fortunate to get a premium from this cheese company. We get paid $3 over the gross pay price for the Federal Order 1 that we're in, plus they pay the hauling, which gives us a net over what we would get from the cooperative of about $4.50 per hundredweight. Milk that the cheese plant does not use does go to Land Lakes Cooperative. We're still members of Land Lakes and have an arrangement as a jugger status herd for Land of Lakes, whereby they don't have to receive all of our milk. Uh, they're taking our surplus milk. Bull calves. Anybody that's a Jersey breeder know, understands that bull calves are problematic as to uh, what their future should be. And so about uh, six or eight years ago, we decided to keep the bull calves. And we've been keeping them since then. About half of our bull calves are raised like this as meadow veal and the other half we keep and feed them out to two to two and a half years as grass fed and finished beef. Okay. Uh, the veal calves at times a year when we have uh, surplus dairy cows or spent dairy cows, this cow I think had a bad hip, the cow over there, the milking machine didn't work just right on her. So we get some of these problematic cows and we use them as surrogate mothers four, three to four bull calves. Uh, they'll be on the pasture like this, the uh, cows and the calves are eating the pasture and certainly the calves are nursing the cows. Uh, there's more than three to four calves, there's a cow missing off the slide, uh, side of this photograph. So there were three cows with these calves. They'll raise the calves up to about 120 to 140 days of age and then they're marketed as uh, meadow veal. So here's an example of a meadow veal calf that is just about finished. This calf's probably three months old or a little better. And um, the good part of the story is that this is about a thousand dollar calf to the uh, restaurant market. So the development of this market has been tremendously helpful for us as, uh, as an avenue to deal with Jersey bull calves. And today we don't necessarily mind a calf being born when he's a bull. Uh, key to making that work, though, is having a USDA inspected butcher shop only about 30 miles from our farm. And so it's very convenient for us to get uh, steers and veal calves to the butcher shop. Uh, quite often, uh, they could be hundreds of miles away from a, from a farm. To sell to a restaurant market, uh, it has to go through a USDA inspected facility. 
So that meat is uh, processed at Haas's family butcher shop. Uh, this is a slide of uh, some veal. Uh, quite most of the veal goes into the high-end restaurant markets, uh, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Annapolis. Um, as I said, half of the bull calves are kept as grass-fed and finished beef. That also uh, is processed at Haas's butcher shop. Uh, one, one little educational thing with consumers, you get a little bit of yellow fat with jerseys and uh, to somebody that's thinking about beef, yellow fat means an old cold dairy cow and you just have to educate them that Jersey beef is going to have a yellower fat just due to the natural pigments uh, in that breed of cows. Uh, a lot of our beef goes to restaurants. This is a local restaurant uh, about 10 miles from our home. Um, they have a, uh, every Thursday night, they have a burger night uh, and feature St. Bridget's uh, grass-fed beef as their burger. <coughs> we sell some to farmer's markets. This was a farmer's market in New York City, New Amsterdam market. Uh, we sell some beef to s special events. This was a hamburger cook-off that was held last winter. But our favorite is uh, what we call the medley of meats, and we have... Uh, Numerous customers in our county, or, or surrounding counties actually, that subscribe to a $50, $100, or $200 monthly subscription to a medley of meat. They don't know what they're going to get. They know they're going to get $50 worth each time. And that happens on the first Saturday of every month. And uh, we take it to a local drop-off point in town. And uh, it works very, very well. So that's how we handle our uh, bull calves. And then the uh, next thing I wanted to talk about is the surplus dairy cows. Um, as Judy showed earlier, we have a, uh, a pretty high pregnancy rate. We have quite a low calf mortality rate. We have a low involuntary cull rate. She showed 6% of our cows are sold to the cull market or beef market. Okay. And we have zero internal herd growth. We're not going to get bigger. It's just the two of us and uh, a little bit of part-time help. Farm is only 55 acres of pasture. We're not growing, OK? So if you combine these four things, uh, you got to do the math. But what the math turns out to be is they just keep coming, and they're coming, and they're coming. You know, you got to move some excess animals off of the farm. <coughs> and so we do move about 30 to 35% of our milking herd each year gets sold to other farms for dairy purposes. Okay. That's wonderful for the other farms. It's also wonderful for us. Um, and you can imagine the opportunity for advances in genetic improvement in a herd if you get to sell 30 35% each year voluntarily. Okay. Um, now, the animals we're selling are commercial cows. They're registered jerseys, but they're commercial jerseys. Okay. They're, these are our cows. These are real working jerseys. This is. Uh, some other slides uh, from other farms. Quite often they're sold into Holstein herds that want to get into jerseys or do some crossbreeding. Uh, but generally, each year it's been quite, uh, quite easy for us to sell. And I would give a lot of the credit to the U.S. Jersey. Um, not that U.S. Jersey has sold them for us, but U.S. Jersey has done a tremendous job in the United States of promoting the breed and uh, making people aware of the benefits of Jersey. And so that has helped us tremendously. Now a little bit more about the economics. Um, I dug into our numbers a bit and uh, what we're going to look at here is the five-year average and the five-year gross sales average for our farm is just under $350,000. 73% of those gross sales come from fluid milk, 10% from excess Jersey cows, 9% from the grass-fed beef, and 8% from meadow veal. So you can see 17% of our income comes from bull calves being born. We're feeling pretty good about that. Now on the expense side, uh, this slide gets a little busy, so I've uh, broken it out here. 39% um, of our expenses are feed costs. Um, 
in the modern day dairy world, this is very low. For conventional farms, it's quite often, especially with high grain prices lately, for 50 to as much as 60% of the expenses to be feed. Um, one of the keys to our economic viability is the fact that with, through the grazing model, our feed expenses are only 39% of our income. Uh, a little bit about labor. You see I've got this broken out in three areas. Owner's draw, hired labor, and custom hire. Owner's draw is what uh, Judy and I take out of the business for normal family living. Okay. Uh, all of our labor is part-time labor. And uh, some of our crops that we purchase we do through a custom hire situation. Our manure spreading is through custom hire. Some planting we might do through custom hire. So if you add these three up, it's going to be right at 20%, which is typical for a labor expense in a modern day dairy farm. Okay. And that leaves us with a profit of 10%. 10% profit in this, uh, this multifaceted enterprise. Now, the 10% profit, that's going to go to pay, uh, go to pay taxes, could pay the debt service, capital improvements on the farm. That's 10% over and above what we take out of the business for personal. So in summary, a five-year average from 2007 to 11, um, and you got to keep in mind that uh, this includes 2009, which if any of you are in the dairy business, which I know some of you are, you remember what 2009 was like. We lost about $75,000 in 2009, so these averages include 2009. Uh, leaves us with a profit of about $33,000 a year. Now, as Judy and I were preparing this uh, presentation, she said, Bob, we ought to figure out what our cost of production is. Somebody's going to ask, what is your cost of production? And I said, yeah, we should know that. And uh, so I got to think about it. And I, I, first I said to myself, cost of producing what? OK. We're producing a lot of things here. We're producing high component milk. So you can't compare the cost of 100 pounds of Jersey milk to 100 pounds of Holstein milk. We're producing beef, we're producing meadow veal, and we're producing ex excess livestock. So I couldn't come up with cost of producing what. And then I got to say to myself, I don't really care what the cost of it is. I really care about the margin. Okay? This is not a low cost type of operation. I hope it's a high margin operation. So I did the math to see what our profit per acre was. I wasn't so much interested what our profit per cow was. Our land is our highest capital expense. It's our greatest asset. Okay? And I wanted to know what the profit was per acre of land. On a five-year average, it has averaged $600 per acre per year. So I wanted to put that into perspective a little bit. I have a neighbor who's a corn grower, and I said, um, Roy, how much profit are we going to make per acre on corn, not considering the cost of the land? Okay. Um, and he said, you know, an average yield with today's prices, um, today's fertilizer costs, he would like to think that his profit per acre would be $350 to $400 a year. I also asked uh, Mike Hosterman, with the Farm Credit Service. In the Northeast United States, there's a, a Farm Credit offers a service called the Northeast Dairy Business Profit Group. Northeast Dairy Business Profit Group. And they analyze in depth, in great depth, the dairy records for about 170, most of them quite large herds in the Northeast United States. The top 20 of those herds in the Northeast United States, which averaged 1,500 cows each, their profit per acre of land that was farmed, not necessarily land that was owned, but land that they farmed, rented and owned, was $577 for 2010. For the average of all the 170 herds, it was about $350 for 2010. So I just share those numbers with you to say that although $33,000 doesn't sound like a lot of profit in today's world for a small intensified operation on a per acre basis, uh, I came away feeling pretty good about it. 
So with that one, I'm going to, um, who's going to talk this about this? You I'm are. Gonna, mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about another cornerstone that we have, ecological soundness. Now St. Bridget's Farm is uh, located about where the uh, X is there, or star. And this is the Chesapeake Bay, which you've perhaps heard of. Washington, D.C. would be uh, sort of right in here. And the Chesapeake Bay is uh, often in the news as a, one of the spoiled waterways or one of the spoiled estuaries in North America. And indeed it is. Uh, there are about 17 million people in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The watershed covers 64,000 square miles and it drains water from six different states, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and West Virginia. Now to put this in perspective a little bit, 64,000 square miles is just a shade bigger than the state of Wisconsin. Okay. Um, in these six different states, there's just a few more cows that are in the state of Wisconsin. Okay. So what I'm getting at, the land size and the number of cows are about the same. However, we have 17 million people in our watershed, New York City, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, Richmond. Okay. And in um, Wisconsin, there's about five and a half million people. So there's a big difference from a people perspective. Another thing that's quite different about the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed, if you uh, recognize some of these familiar bodies of water and consider the ratio of watershed area to water volume, you can see that the Chesapeake Bay stands out as having a huge area of land relative to the volume of water. It's just not very big. It's not very deep is the real problem. And so this coupled with tons and tons of people uh, created an environmental problem. And so being a dairy farmer living you know, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, very close to the Chesapeake Bay, uh, manure becomes quite important to us. Manure is very important to us to keep on the farm for its nutritive value. And it's also very important to Judy and me to keep out of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, one of the questions we commonly get is, what do you do with your manure that the cows leave on the pasture? About 70% of our manure that the cows produce does get deposited on the pasture. And we really do nothing with it. We don't, um, we don't spread it. We allow it to stay in this fashion, to dry, and uh, have the earthworms and dung beetles you know, basically take it down. Uh, the pastures themselves are quite friendly to uh, avoiding runoff of nutrients from the farm. They, uh, they slow down water flow. They filter the uh, particulate matter out of the uh, runoff. And so, um, yeah, manure becomes a big topic for us. Now, I show this slide. Uh, our farm is at the, this is a marshy area just below our pasture. It's the headwaters of Morgan Creek, which goes into the Chester River, which uh, is a major tributary in the Chesapeake Bay. And um, in this picture we have uh, one, two, three, four, there's seven cows in this picture. And I wanted to point out, uh, there's about seven snow egrets there too, but seven cows. And those seven cows um, do two things for us as far as uh, helping with the sustainability of this farm and the sustainability of uh, the Chesapeake, or in protection of the Chesapeake Bay. And the two things they do is that if, uh, I'm going to show my bias here, but if they, are, if they were Holsteins, that same section of pasture, it would only handle about five cows. Okay? So five Holsteins or seven Jerseys. Now there was recently an article in Hordes Dairyman where they compared the income over feed cost of Holsteins to Jerseys, looking at the less feed that a Jersey would eat, uh, the higher components, so a higher price for the Jersey milk, but less milk, and really did a wonderful job comparing it. And the bottom line of that comparison was that the income over feed costs per day for a Holstein and a Jersey were very, very similar. The article tilted it a little bit towards Jerseys, saying that they were slightly more profitable. And I would have to argue that little nuances that occur from farm to farm to farm can tilt it just as easily to Holstein on a per cow per day. But with a jersey, 
I get to have seven cows. I get to have the income over feed cost on seven cows. For a Holstein, I would have the same income over feed cost on five cows. Which one would you rather be? The other thing I would say here, uh, the carbon footprint of jerseys versus other breeds, or jerseys other than Holsteins. Um, uh, Judy Capper and uh, Roger Cady from Washington State did a study last year uh, looking at uh, thousands of cows in 45 different states in the country. I think you might even have a paper on it on your seat. And they showed that per unit of cheese production, the Jersey cow had a 20% lower carbon footprint than did the milk produced by a Holstein. So, uh, both of those things work for us to sustain the farm and protect the bay. Uh, more about ecological soundness. All of our pastures are surrounded by permanent fencing that keep, uh, keep cows and manure out of sensitive, sensitive areas on the farm. Okay. Uh, we have a three-wire perimeter fence, which the top and the bottom are electric. Uh, we have a little bit of CRP land in our farm in a, uh, a filtration water strip. All of the uh, liquid and slurry type manure from all the buildings and the milking parlor and so forth all go underground into this liquid manure storage tank. Um, that manure is either exported off of the farm to a neighboring corn grower that also grows our corn silage. Um, we have just recently built a 8,000 cubic foot uh, semi-solid manure storage facility to handle the manure from a, a uh, heifer and dry cow barn. Uh, most of that manure is spread by a custom harvester or custom operators. Uh, we like to turbo till the ground before the manure is spread so that it goes in rather than runs off. So with that, and we'll have time for questions uh, when we get to the end here, but with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Judy to talk about the uh, community influence. Good. Thanks, Bob. So our last cornerstone of sustainability is a positive community influence, and sometimes that's called social justice. And we don't dis disdain the term social justice, just a little loftier than what we tend to think, but for sustain for in terms of our farm for social justice, we treat our employees and any volunteers and help we have very well. We tend to pay well. You can even see that this gentleman right here in the middle is in the audience, Bob's dad. And he's one of our best helpers whenever we need anything done. And it's funny, when I first started milking, I started with 60 open jer jerseys. So I had 62-year-old heifers milking at the same time. And Bob's dad came up to help me one day. And he went home and he told Bob's brother, she needs help. So um, he was there to help us whenever we needed it. And we have lots of um, young people we like to work with on our farm, as well as um, permanent employees and neighbors who help us. As Bob said, we custom harvest our silage. So our neighbor across the street grows our corn silage from, uh, for us. And our neighbor down the road harvests it for us. And as a matter of fact, the son of the neighbor down the road is um, helping us while we're gone for these couple of days. Another neighbor um, has excess uh, straw that he delivers right to our farm and we put up. His grandson worked for me for about a year. I wish he still worked for me, but he went home to the, help his granddad out. Can't fight granddad, so I lost him recently, but he was a great help. Um, and I did my bills the other day and I went to the mailbox and we have a local and out of town and about 17 of my checks went into that local mailbox. So we may be small, but a lot of our income goes right back out into our little local community of Kennedyville, which is really a small, you know, just a crossing. It doesn't have anything, no stores, just a post office. But we have a lot of small businesses, and we try to use our plumber, our electrician, um, the excavator. We have a feed mill. We, have a, we used to have a southern state store. They just went out of business. But um, we try to keep as much money within the community as possible. And we never say no to a tour group. So Washington College is a small liberal arts college um, about 15 miles from us, and they've had this program called the Center for the Environment and Society. And we've been on their uh, itinerary since the beginning of that program. This is now the fourth year. And the first year, the, one of the students, Julia, did a project on local foods in the college, and there was no local movement within the college at that time. So she talked to the dining hall superintendent and the chef, and we interviewed with the chef, and um, she interviewed him on, the, on her um, 
uh, video for the project. And so as a result of that project, two things happened. We got into Washington College to sell them ground beef and some other larger cuts. And I got to hire Julia. I needed a milker. We, we scratch where we can. So we needed a milker when I was going to a sustainable ag research and education committee meeting that I was on for 10 years. And so I said, Julia, how would you like to learn to milk cows? Because she had milked a little bit during the uh, project that she worked with us. And she said, sure. So she's milking while we're gone up here today, too. So um, we love having the college kids come and see what a farm is like. They've never been to a dairy farm before. And so to show them how a dairy farm can be sustainable within the Chesapeake watershed and help the local community is something we really like to teach them. And we feed them lunch. We feed them a ground uh, uh, burgers and uh, salad and apple crisp. And uh, we had one student went to the car to get her ham sandwich because she was a transitioning vegetarian. But other than that, our beef is very well recepted, <laughs> received. We also host what, uh, a group from the Echo Hill Outdoor School, which brings in um, elementary up to college students in for different programs. So they'll come out to our farm and we talk to them about nitrogen and the importance of it, as well as some of the problems with handling it. And uh, they ask a lot of really good questions and they're another wonderful group to explore our farm. And uh, every spring, I have every single fourth grader from Kent County. We have five elementary schools come out to the farm over two days. And we have three stations where we show them about uh, dairy cows and farming and what cows eat and how um, dairy products are good for them. And this was one of the letters we got this year from one of the fourth graders that was particularly charming. I love the last part. The best part was petting little Noelle and looking at the milking parlor. But petting Noelle was the best part because she was so calm and soft. I love this trip, and someday I want to be a dairy farmer. You inspired me so much. So I've got her name. We'll see. <laughs> and finally, our uh, signature event we started four years ago was called the Field to Fork Dinner. And a friend of mine had said to me, sent me an article from a magazine that said, talked about these dinners. And I said, well, I can't afford to feed 100 people. And she's like, no, you charge them. I'm like, oh, really? Well, what a good idea. OK. So we thought we'd try. And I said, well, we don't know how much it's all going to cost us. So we said, well, any money that's left over, we'll just donate to a cause. So the first year, we donated it to Heifer International. The second year, we donated it to a friend of ours who was running for um, the local state assembly. And had a, he had a strong ag portfolio. And then last year, we um, donated it to the Kent County High School Culinary Arts Program and used a couple of their students as servers. And this year, our beneficiary was the um, Echo Hill Outdoor School Explore Program Scholarship Program, which will give money to Kent County students to go to Echo Hill to do a three or two, three, or five day camping trip down the Chester River. So we're really thrilled with that. So this was from our uh, second year. And you can see the cows going out to pasture right before the guests sat down for dinner. And uh, this was the third year where we had the um, culinary arts program. You can see Chef Keller over there to the left. And um, we don't have speakers at our dinner, but we do let um, our guests learn from our farmers who have provided the food. So we source all our food locally. Everything but the salad dressing is local. And so um, the farmer who makes the cheese, Holly and Eric Foster, they talk and they come to our dinner. Then we have the two vegetable providers. Um, we provide the beef and the cream or the milk to make the menu. And this was plan B, because this year our dinner was October 1st, and it was quite cold and windy. So we turned our maternity pen. Bob lined the walls with straw. And this is one of the students from the high school setting the table. And he was so funny. He got to the farm, and he was sitting in the car waiting for, the she for Chef Keller to come. And I talked to him. I said, hey, how you doing? He's like, I said, well, let's go. He's like, no, I think I'll wait for Chef Keller. I was like, no, come on, let's go. We got work to do. And so I practically pulled him out of the car and said goodbye to his mom, who's one of the fourth grade teachers who's been to our farm. And uh, he looked a little scared to death, but I put him right to work. And later, when he gave his little talk, he said, that lady made me get out of my car, but I, was, I had a really good time, and they put me right to work, and I love this job. I'm inspired, and it's a dinner I'll never forget. And uh, so that was really a nice comment. This is our menu from this year. Our daughter-in-law-to-be does all of the graphic work for us. And you can, say, you can see we have Jersey milk on the menu and the um, tomato soup. And this year, we did meatloaf. We just thought, you know, it's, it's a comfort food year. So we're going to do meatloaf. And to our surprise, meatloaf was one of the most popular menu items. Everybody said, I love meatloaf. And this was really good meatloaf. So we tried to feature some ground beef or veal item in our, in our main dish. 
And each year we have about 100 people. This year we had about 126 people at the dinner, so we made a record close to $3,000 that we could contribute to the Explore program. So this is the cocktail party. And you can see the cows are right in the background. And we're missing that whole section of the cows walking in. No, that's later. OK. And sorry. And so anyhow, to wrap up the year, we make some high test eggnog. And we give it out to uh, Pop Fry and all the other local friends and family members. We make about eight gallons of high test eggnog. And um, we save wine bottles throughout the year. And uh, it's a labor of love. It's a lot of work. But we saw that cream separator uh, out there at one of the exhibit booths. So we might take that idea home with us so we don't have to cream it off the top for a couple of days. And uh, that's been a very popular item. And people get on the list. And they say, don't take me off your list. So they, uh, they look forward to it every year. And we look forward to it every year. So now Bob's going to take you through the first six months of a quick run view of our farm. And then we'll. Uh, We'll have a few extra minutes for questions and answers. So um, in uh, the introductory slide, Judy said we were uh, seasonal. And uh, because it's seasonal, and uh, when Sherry came to our farm, she could only see, you know, like one very short season, one weekend, like, you know. And it changes all of the time. I mean, it's every week something's different going on. So we put together a few photographs that we collected uh, recently that kind of take you through the 12 months. and. Uh, in Maryland, sometimes we do get some snow. And uh, two winters ago, we got a lot of snow. Uh, I think we had a record of like uh, I don't know, 80 or 90 inches of snow for the whole winter. But uh, it was just one snowstorm after another. And this might be typical in this part of the country. But it's not always typical for us. Uh, here we are, Jan uh, January 13th, 2007. Um, and we still got cows out on pasture. So we can have three feet of snow, or we can have a situation like this. And it takes a lot of flexibility, both in your mindset and the facilities, to manage, manage both of them. This is certainly our preference. Um, but generally, it is wintertime there. We do get some snow cover. Not all winter long do we have snow cover. But because it's wintertime, grass grow, goes dormant, and most all of our animals will come inside for the winter. Heifers and dry cows would be in this barn, and uh, they're on a uh, hay grain diet. Uh, we can only feed corn silage to the milking cows, and so all the rest are on hay and grain. And um, here's just a little video clip of uh, Jersey heifers kind of waiting, uh, waiting for the next meal. Our free stalls, uh, both in the heifer barn and the milking barn, are uh, a wooden free stall design that uh, We'll see another picture that's perhaps a little better on that. Our calves are born in uh, starting in late January. They all calve inside in bedded pens. Uh, late January, February, March, uh, and then a few tail enders in April and May. Um, uh, let me back up here. Uh, newborn calf management, um, we get Two quarts of colostrum into them when they're still wet, hopefully. Two more quarts of colostrum into them by the time they're uh, six to 10 hours old would be the longest. So they get a gallon of colostrum, uh, certainly before 10 hours. They get their navels dipped, and um, that's it for newborns. Uh, we feel that uh, high quality colostrum uh, sanitation and hygiene and a good vaccination protocol in the adult cows avoids the need for having to do vaccinations and injections and so on and so forth to a calf this age. From the calving pen, uh, we go just as quickly as possible to an individual calf hutch. Um, we have 40 calf hutches. And I'll make a, a point here that this is one of the downsides to a, a seasonal herd. We've got to have as many calf hutches as a three or 400 cow dairy would have to have. And we're only a 75 cow dairy, and that's because they're all born at the same time. All these hutches will be full by the end of the calving season. Um, so this is a nice day for the calf hutches, but it's not always that nice because we get wind. And this was a real bad morning. These hutches, <laughs> these hutches were, uh, the calves had been removed from here when I took this photograph, there wasn't time to take a picture when I first went out there that morning. But um, 
Yeah, we get wind and uh, we get rain, we get high water, and we get some snow. Um, and we even get more snow. And, um, but the calves seem to do fine in the hutches. Uh, if you keep the hutches clean on the inside, keep the back panels closed, uh, they, they do absolutely fine. Some of you that are uh, Jersey enthusiasts might remember this being on the cover of the journal here uh, a couple years ago. Our cows go out uh, outside quite early in the springtime. And this is probably a photograph taken in uh, late March or early April. Just as soon as the grass breaks dormancy, we want to get them outside. We're anxious to get them outside. They're anxious to get outside. And the pastures need you to get out there early. Okay? So you can see that this grass is still quite short. Uh, the trees don't even have leaves on them yet. But if we wait for this grass to get you know, six inches tall for some prime time grazing, then 10 days, two weeks later, the whole farm is out of control. So you got to get out early to start the grazing wedge uh, or it will get out of control. We graze uh, from April all the way up through to uh, hopefully the beginning of December. Okay, that's, that's about the limit for us. So here's a, a summer t summertime grazing photograph. Uh, earlier you saw the three-wire perimeter fence. All of our internal fencing are uh, temporary uh, poly wire step-in posts. Um, in order to be able to grow grass through the heat and drought of the summer, we do have the option of having some irrigation. We can irrigate, we can really reach the entire farm with water, but we don't have enough water when it becomes extremely dry to service the entire farm. You know, we, we, can, we can get it there, but we don't have enough water. And so we've learned over the years to, when it starts to get quite dry, to shrink in the amount of farm that we're going to irrigate and really grow plenty of grass on a s s uh, smaller amount of acreage than trying to keep the whole farm green. The other thing that we'll graze uh, through the summer is a warm season annual called sorghum. Uh, it does extremely well. You can see here where the cows grazed yesterday. And they can be in a paddock like this for 12 hours, and they'll have it decked down just uh, the same way you see here on the left. They love the sorghum. They milk very well off of it. They test well when they're on the sorghum. And uh, we'll get about three to four grazings from June to September off of this sorghum. It'll come back the second, third, and fourth time looking just like this. Our cows do a fair amount of walking. Um, most of our laneways are quite narrow, uh, and they typically walk single file. Um, and so that puts a lot of pressure on our laneways. You say, why are the laneways so narrow? And that's because our farm is small, and every square foot, every acre is, uh, is valuable to us. And so we didn't want to spend, you know, you, know, you know, have a 10, 15 foot laneway just for the cows to walk down there, because they typically walk single file anyway. Sometimes it can be quite wet on the laneway, and other times we get high water and it can be, excuse me, the previous slide quite dry. Here's the quite mm -hmm. wet time of year. This is right after Hurricane Irene, where the water was getting pretty high. And so um, the answer that we came up with for protecting our laneway and protecting the cows' feet was to use rubber belting on the laneway. Uh, and this is a eight ton roll of rubber belting that came from a coal mine in western Pennsylvania. It was used rubber belting that they were finished with. Uh, we got two of these rolls and um, put it down the entire laneway, the whole length of the farm. And it has worked tremendous. The cows do walk on the laneway. Um, it, uh, it's, it's basically a real, real low maintenance type uh, design. And here's another shot right after Hurricane Irene. You can see that, uh, you know, if, if the rubber belting wasn't there, cows would be going in up to their knees if they had to go through something like this. So I'm going to turn the microphone back over to Judy. Um, she didn't really indicate it, but Judy's a person that's at the farm 100% of the time and does 99% uh, of the day-to-day -day work. And so the next few pictures are going to show some of the work that Judy does there. And uh, 
with the cows. Thanks. Well, one of my favorite jobs is bringing the cows in and out. It just doesn't get better than going out first thing in the morning. You're by yourself. with I, got, I have a border collie, so I take my dog with me, and she goes and does whatever she wants, but she has a good time, too. And you look up at the stars, and you go out and you get your cows, and they're just happy to come in. And it's just like the best. It's the best. I'm the luckiest person. So here we are letting the cows in. Oops. And uh, we just got a little video. Sherry, want to thank immensely. Sherry and Bob did all the video uh, work for the presentation today. We do all our own artificial insemination. You can see some of the tail heads are marked with green chalk or pink chalk. Just let it go. So then they come into the barn. This is a summertime video. So they'll come in midday, or actually it's early fall. So they come in midday. And you can see we have some pretty cows. They're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna be here, but they're certainly not ugly and they're really fun to work with. We we concentrate a lot on the Jersey Utter Index and uh, try to get those high rear udders up there so that we have the best udder to work with in our flat barn. These are our free stalls. We got the plans from the Jersey Cattle Association back when Mike Brown worked for them. Cows come in and they have water. We have two, three waterers that they have access to when they come in from pasture. This is our flat barn. We have a double eight flat barn with automatic takeoffs. And here they are. We feed grain in the barn, but they've licked it clean, so you, there's not much left for you to see for that. Sherry's scaring them a little bit. They're usually a little more relaxed in there, but. And then we feed them hay this time of year. We're feeding them a little hay after milking because our grass got a little wet in this last couple of weeks. It's not quite as nice as we would like it. So it's a little bit of a feed cushion. We're feeding them some nice oat hay. They have water in every pasture. And um, you can see them really enjoying what they have. We were very fortunate, one of the I bought our second year grazing through Bob's connections at New Bolton Veterinary Clinic in, at the U University of Pennsylvania. Two Irish grazers stopped by our farm one day. They were brothers. And they just went to town telling us what we should do, how we should do it. And within four hours, we learned more than we would have going to you know, 20 extension meetings. No offense, extension. But they were just so intense. And um, they just taught us pretty much everything we needed to know in four hours. And they had a good time doing it. So we just take the sunshine, the cow, and the grass, and we put it all together and make some really uh, high quality milk and high quality beef. And so this shows you some of the before and after and some of our fencing. And then in the winter, or you want me to keep that line? And then the winter time, we still do a little bit of grazing. We outwinter our steers, so um, they have to rough it a little bit. But they're pretty hardy souls. Um, and this year, we did a private party for a, a young woman who called us, found us on the website. She had worked for Woodbury Kitchen, the restaurant in our slide earlier, and she knew about our field to fork dinner. And she wanted to do a surprise birthday party for her dad in Chestertown near us, and she needed a place to have the the big party for 90 people. So she asked us if we would do it. And she wrote such a nice letter. I said, well, what have I got to lose? Although it could have been a nightmare, but it wasn't. They were delightful to work with. And um, her father, David's father, her grandfather was there, and he spoke at the birthday dinner. And no one in the family knew that he had had cows as a little boy. And he'd had a Guernsey, a Holstein, and a Jersey. And he told them all the story of that. And he said, well, you know, the Holstein and the Guernsey, I didn't really have much use for, but that Jersey cow. I loved that Jersey cow. And he said, you can look in the eye of a Jersey and see her soul. And that just really made our day. And we really are so appreciative of the Jersey cow that uh, we, uh, we, we work with her every day and we just love her. So um, that's that part. And then Bob just has a little bit on grass to show you real quickly. Yep. So we're going to um, go back to the classroom here a little bit. And uh, this slide shows a, a wonderful photograph. This is from the North Island of New Zealand. 
of a, uh, of a group of about, uh, this is probably three or 400 cows on a paddock of grass. And I want to uh, read a quote here from Andre Voisson, who was a, uh, a person well before his uh, time. Um, you can see he's, uh, we've been without Andre Voisson for quite a few years now, but he said, managed intensive grazing is not simply turning cows out to pasture, but rather helping grass grow and guiding the cow to harvest it properly. I think that's really neat. Our job is to help the grass grow and guide the cow to harvest it properly. So one of the questions that we get on our farm quite often is, what kind of grass do you have? What, what grass do you grow? And uh, we grow a bunch of different types. And so we made these uh, slides to try, to try to explain the grasses we have and, and why we have them. So one of the grasses is perennial ryegrass. And on all these charts that I'm going to show you, this goes from January to December. And on this axis over here, this is the percent of the herd's forage requirement that that grass supplies. Okay? So this is how perennial ryegrass grows. It's dormant in the wintertime. It really kicks off here in March, uh, peaks in April. And so you can see in April, 60% of our herd, when I'm talking about our herd, I'm talking about the milking herd, the dry herd, the heifers, the steers, the whole deal. 60% okay? of our forage requirements are met in April and May with perennial ryegrass. And you get into the summertime, ryegrass does not like heat. Once the soil temperature gets over about 80 degrees, ryegrass pretty much gets dormant. And then this time of year that we're in right now, September, October, November, ryegrass kicks in again. So this is the grass growth curve for ryegrass. Um, but we need to cover these other times, so we plant some other types of grass. Another section of our, of our farm is in a mixed pasture of endophyte-free fescue, orchard grass, and some white clover. This is kind of how that grows. It really does quite well in the summer. When it gets really hot or dry in July and August, it might dip down a little bit, picks up here again this time of year, and then tapers off in November. So to make up for this slump here in uh, June and July, this is when we, when we plant the brown midrib sorghum that you saw this picture of earlier. The goal here is to get as much forage for the entire herd for as much of the year as possible. So what can we do for these areas on the uh, outskirts here? That's where annual cereal rye plays a role. We'll plant that uh, as soon as we're finished grazing the sorghum. We plant at the end of August the cereal rye and by the end of September it's ready to graze and we'll be able to graze that all the way through the end of December, a little bit in, even in January. Now, if you add up all these humps, you start to come up to over 100% at certain times of the year. And our goal is to harvest as much of this as possible. When you do add up all the humps, this is how it looks. Um, you can see where the bar is for 100% of the herd's forage requirement. So um, we're feeding largely stored feeds, corn silage and hay, during this time of the year. Spring gets here, the steers go outside, the heifers go outside, the cows go outside, and we still have too much forage. We're a small farm, we don't have hay making equipment or silage making equipment, and you can't really get a custom harvester to come in and make, you know, what's he gonna make, five acres, three acres of hay? It wouldn't make sense. So we, we have surplus dairy cows, remember, and we keep 100% of those surplus during this period of time, okay? And we'll get up to milking almost 90 cows at this point, as soon as the grass starts running short, okay, which is usually early June, that's when the 30 excess cows or the 25 excess cows are going to leave there. Because we don't dare want to get into a situation where we don't have enough grass for the you know, livestock on the farm. Our goal would be to have 100% all the time. So during this period of time here, the excess dairy sales stay on the farm until that's gone and then during the shortages in the year is when we feed the uh, stored forage. Now, to make all this work, calving has to happen then, uh, which means timed AI breeding for the following year's calving occurs for us in mid-May. So every year, we don't breed any cows until mid-May, May 17th, May 19th, we, we pick a day, and that's gonna uh, have them all calving about this time. 
Now, this slide shows our daily milk production over the course of time. Uh, this is about 10 years worth of data. The yellow boxes here are the average milk production per month. Over, so for September, 55 pounds a day, average over the last 10 years. Uh, and with calving occurring here, this graph really is basically a lactation curve because we get a whole herd of cows calved here, and there's the lactation herd curve for those cows. This low production here are a few uh, carryover cows that didn't get pregnant on time in an earlier year that were still milking in January or February, and then our two-year-olds start calving a little, little bit before the milking cows. If you superimpose the monthly milk production over top of the amount of grass that we produce, it's kind of neat how they sort of fit. And that's the whole idea behind what makes this very economical. This is very cheap feed at a time when we're getting the most milk, which gives us the most margin of income at that time of year. So with that, uh, I want to conclude. I'll share our website there, uh, www.stbridgetsfarm, with no apostrophe in there, .com. Um, welcome you anytime for a visit. And also to share with you, we're looking for a uh, <laughs> full-time worker. So if you know of somebody that uh, would be interested in this type of dairy farming, um, we'd love to visit with you. And we can even leave you with some information today, or you can get in touch with us uh, through the website. Sherry, questions? Yep. How's our time coming, uh, Sherry? Where? Sherry? No, they're going. <laughs> Sherry, Sherry, how's our time? Mm -hmm. Okay, question here. Thank you. <laughs> they run out the door. Okay. So our first question is, do, do we have any issues with milk fever? There have been some years that we've had big issues with milk fever, as much as 20% milk fever. Uh, but I would think in the last uh, six or seven years we've figured that out and we're probably only 5% milk fever now. So all feed related? Uh, yes. Well, they were older well, cows, you know, traditional. Feed, feed and breed related. Certainly the Jersey is more predisposed to getting milk fever than uh, the other breeds, but, uh, but I feel like we can control it uh, better with feed. Yep, so we, the, the, her question is, uh, how, how are we able to keep a tight window uh, for a seasonal breeding herd? And uh, yes, we do keep breeding the cows that do not get pregnant. We get about 80 to 85% pregnant in the first uh, 63 days. That's our goal. We get about 85% in 63 days. That's a real nice window. Okay. But we keep breeding the rest of them because if you stop breeding them, she's a beef cow worth about $350. If you keep breeding them and get them pregnant, they can be worth $1,500. So they'll keep breeding them, you know. Other questions? Yes, sir. What age are you weaning, and what do you do about sucking? Mm -hmm. His question is, uh, what age do we wean, and uh, what do we do about sucking? We wean at 42 days of age. At 35 days of age, they, uh, we start to feed them once a day, milk once a day. Wean at 42 days of age. Uh, they stay in the hutch until they're about 60 days of age, and then they go into group pens. Um, I don't have the complete answer for pen mate sucking, but uh, I would say that we've gotten a lot better with that over the years. Um, it doesn't happen right after they're weaned and just put into group pens. It seems to happen more when they reach uh, puberty. You know, eight, nine, ten months of age, they start to get bored, they get more active with each other, and, uh, and that's when you get the pen mate sucking. It happens worse when they get hungry, so if you can avoid them getting hungry uh, is one solution. We also hang, uh, in the, and when they're inside, we have tires hanging from the, uh, the rafters with salt blocks in them, and they play with those, and that, that seems to help as well. But we do timeouts, we put them in isolation pens? Yep. 
We try to break them from that. We see we tend to see it in some cow families. So. Yep. Then they're done that no, success with the rings. They come out, then you can't remember who. Yeah, you know, nah, nah, we don't like the rings. Other questions. So the question is, do we do anything special with corn silage variety treatments? Y yes, we do. We, uh, in our custom contracting of corn silage to be grown, we get to specify the hybrid. And for the last uh, three years, it's a, been a brown midrib hybrid. So we try to feed high quality corn silage uh, as well. We have, uh, we have a part-time calf feeder that starts uh, with us the end of January and goes through the beginning of April. This is what we have had. And then we had an outside person for two days a week, two, day, two whole days, two days a week. And then I've had some miscellaneous milking assistance. We'd like to roll all of that into one full-time person. Sure. And uh, that would mean we wouldn't have to train people when we go to leave. We get to leave a little bit more. And we're figuring we're at that stage now where we can kind of afford to do that and bring maybe bring a young person along for a couple, three years and train them and give them some skills to go off and maybe do their own farm until someday when we're ready to retire and someone might want to take it over. Oh. Uh, question in the back. Mm -hmm. um, so his question is about uh, seasonal calving, but having it being a fall season calving herd, right? And some people even do a split season, have a calf in the spring, calf in the fall. The only thing I would say to that is that you're going to calve at this time of year, okay? That means you're going to have your peak milk production in December when your feed costs are going to be the highest. Okay, your feed costs are going to be the highest end because you're going to be growing the least amount of grass when the cows have the greatest appetite and are going to be at their greatest production efficiency. I would prefer to have the most milk when I have the cheapest feed and the highest quality feed. That's the only downside to it, I would think. I just noticed again in the heat in the community where we're at. Yep. Yeah. Well, we don't calve out in the summer. No, so the thing is to stop calving, sell those cows to somebody else. And uh, then, you know, the only problem we have is a little bit of breeding during the summer, which, you know, those, those tail under cows. One more question. What's your source of grain supplement then? You about Sure. All of our grain is purchased. There's, um, we're only about an hour and a half to two hours from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And there's umpteen feed mills to pick from. But we buy, buy a commercial supplement, exactly. We have six grain tanks, though. Don't let him fool you. We don't buy just a supplement. He never met a grain tank he didn't want to put up. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have we, grain tanks everywhere. Yeah, we got, you know, we got calf feed. We got dry cow feed. We have corn in one and a protein so supplement. So it's, so it's actually a custom pick probably yep. for your farm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we're about out of time. Uh, Judy and I can stay. And uh, you know, if you want to come up and answer questions. Um, Ask questions. Ask questions or answer them too. Yeah. Um, we'd be happy to visit with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.